<laughs> the basement of the Orange Hall is much more conducive to just chilling. <laughs> this is, is what I've decided. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Hi. I'm here with Swing Out Edmonton at Shaw Island Tea, and we're talking to Brad Shigeta today. Hi, Brad. Hello. Good morning. Um, I was just wondering, um, when did you start playing music? Well, uh, actually, I started playing drums at the age of about seven years old uh, because my dad's sister played piano, so he absolutely did not want any of his kids playing piano. So as a result, uh, I was pretty lucky. He bought me a little drum set when I was like seven years old. And uh, I started basically with snare drum rudiments and got bored of not being able to play melodies. Uh, by the time I was in junior high school, and that's when I switched to trombone. So I guess since I was about seven years old. Wow. So it's a long time. And uh, yeah, it's about 30 something, 40 years. Yeah. And you've been playing trombone for? For about 35 years. Wow. Yeah, it's a long time. That's, so in that time, I'm sure you've played many different styles of music. Yes. And so what would you say is your favorite? Um, I've always liked jazz music because uh, you have the freedom to play it differently every time you play it. Um, and I'm also kind of lazy, so I don't, to, for me to play something exactly the same every single time is a real chore. Um, whereas with jazz music, every time you play it, even though it's written notes, you can slightly change the way you attack it, you can change how loud you hit it, you can change so many different things that you can't do with uh, more strict music, like classical music. So, yes, I've always liked jazz music. Okay. And I know the dancers love dancing to your music. Um, do you, do you enjoy uh, playing for, for a dancing crowd? Playing for dancers is my favorite thing because that's what the music was really intended for when it was around in the 1920s and 30s. Um, it was for dancers. And uh, when I was in New York, I got to play with uh, a few bands that uh, performed for the New York Swing Society. And, you know, to have people really who can move in time to the music that you're playing uh, and are really enjoying themselves. That's that's the uh, most you can ask for in a jazz club. A lot of people aren't really listening, and you know it's not it's not quite the same. I prefer the interaction and not so uh, formal as far as like a stage and audience. You know, it's like nice to have dance floor and people around you. It's like a social event. Much more fun. So, how did you? Well, I guess you, you sort of touched on this, but um, dancing or playing in New York, was that how you first got involved with playing for dancers? Um, no, actually, when I, was, when I was in high school, uh, back in Winnipeg, I, my first job was with the Ron Paley Big Band, and we played dances pretty much every weekend. So every Friday and Saturday night, I played like a wedding. People used to hire big bands for the wedding uh, back in the old days. Yeah. And so, yeah, we would... Oh, we'd be playing for dancers uh, then at uh, you know, some big hotel ballroom every Friday and Saturday night. And uh, so that's where I really like to, I really like to do stuff like that with dancers and stuff like live, live people that are moving and not just sitting there and watching it. When do you feel the most inspired to play? What do I feel the most inspired to play? Uh, definitely in the evening, never before 7 p.m. Jazz should never be performed before sundown. Um, I don't know, I've always been a night person. Um, my parents were kind of party people, so they used to drag me around as a little baby to bowling alleys and parties, and I used to fall asleep on, on top of a pile of coats and people's parties and stuff like that. So, And I used to always try to stay awake as long as I could just to see what was happening and I've always I've always worked done my best work at night as far as doing homework and stuff I'm not really not a day person so um, 
Yeah, the best time to play music is after 8 p.m. A lot of the big bands in the old days would make recordings, and we, I did that too uh, when I was with the Ellington Orchestra. You'd play a concert and then go to the recording studio at like 1 or 2 in the morning and record until 5 or 6 in the morning. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, that, but that's, you feel much better than starting a recording session at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. is not a good time to be playing an instrument. Because you're all, you're warmed up, you're yeah, energized, exactly. you're yeah. okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yep. The last time I saw you play yep. was at the uh, the dance and skate or swing and skate, swing and skate. at the swing and skate at City Hall, mm -hmm. and uh, that was in sort of the middle of the day. So it's not quite eight a.m. That's true. But was that a that, little early for you? That was early. That was twelve noon. But yeah. uh, fortunately, I had probably one of the best rhythm sections I've played with so far and it was really fun um, and we had a nice grand piano instead of a plastic yeah. thing that was really nice to uh, it just sounded so good so the band was great yeah, yeah. we had a lot of fun yeah 12 so, noon I was pushing it <laughs> um, and so when did you when did you first play for a swing out Edmonton um, that's a good question. I think it was about a year and a half ago uh, as part of um, Will Kramer's band, who has a band called the Bullies of Basin Street here. Will, Will has been kind of like the banjo player of Edmonton. When people think of banjo in Edmonton, they think of Will Kramer, yeah, whether that's good or bad. Um, and Will uh, luckily uh, needed a swing trombone player and hired me and uh, Berkeley heard me with Will's band and uh, just wanted to know where I came from because I kind of just appeared out of nowhere because um, I'm not from Edmonton and uh, one thing led to another and he asked me to do some of my own things for a swing out right. Edmonton so about a year and a half I've been doing stuff for them. Excellent. Which song is your favorite to play? Ooh. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite song. It changes, you know, depending on what month it is. I go through phases where I, I play one particular song a lot and then I don't play it for a long time. Um, I do like playing old standard tunes from like the 1920s and 30s songs that have melodies that are singable and also very rhythmic, you know, um, I guess like Sweet Georgia Brown is a very um, well-known tune and, you know, it's very rhythmic and uh, so I guess that's, at the moment, that's one of my favorite things to play, okay. but it could change. Um, yeah, I, there's so many good songs, I don't really have a favorite one, but uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, mid-50s is my cutoff. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, see, now you say mid fifties is your cutoff, but we know that you also you play some standards, but you also have um, quite a number of original tunes. Yes. And so, which of your songs would you think, it, or would you say is is the most, or has the most meaning for you? Well, all my original songs are kind of like based on the harmonic progressions that were used in the 20s and 30s, like I Can Have That, yeah. um, you know, it's a modern song. It's kind of like based on Giada a little bit, and um, which was very popular for songwriters to do in those days, use the harmony. Um, which one of my songs has the most meaning to me? Probably I Can Have That, because uh, I, I only write songs about things that actually happened to me and that have meaning. And, at the moment that that happened, I thought that, that would be a good song, so um, I never need music for it. I'll never forget it, and uh, you know, I do have the tendency to make up silly songs uh, depending on what weird situation I'm in, and that was a funny melody I made up when those kids were yelling at me from the windows, and uh, I wrote it down and actually 
is kind of good, and it's an audience participation yeah. thing too. So I think that's my favorite one because it's got a long background story too. I, I can absolutely <laughs> say it's one of my favorite ones because it's guys, a lot of it's a lot of fun, um, and it's a lot of fun to dance to. And it's, I don't know, I, I kind of like, I like the song with the call and response in it. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, audience participation, you know, we're, I'm not, I'm up there to have fun and interact, that's what the way it's supposed to be. And it's really, really fun to, that you guys know my songs and know the lyrics, and, you know, yeah. shout I can have that at the right time. It makes it even more fun. Who, who do you look to for inspiration? So is there any particular artist that has inspired you a lot, or...? Um, yeah, I, I would say, um, as a trombone player, my favorite trombone player, and I got a lot of flack for it when I moved to New York, because there was a famous two trombone band in the 1950s called J&K, with J.J. Johnson and Kay Winding, and every trombone player alive, if you ask them who's the greatest trombone player, they'll say J.J. Johnson, and I always thought Kay Winding was much more interesting and he's kind of like my trombone all around hero because he comes out of the swing tradition of the 1920s, 30s, 40s. His sound has got a lot more depth and dynamic to it and he uses the slide and the slide is the beauty of the, the trombone and J.J. Johnson I, I love but you know he's he never slides into notes or uses the slide to glist and stuff like that. And uh, I like the swing players that slide around, slip and slide around. And Kay Winning definitely does that. And he also can play modern up into the bebop era too. So as far as all around, Kay Winning is my favorite. But I love any of the old swing tribal players, Mike Dickinson, Benny Morton. Uh, there's a lot of old ones that uh, people don't really listen to anymore. Kid Ori, of course, is one of my favorite too, because uh, he is from, the way he plays, it seems very simple at first, and when I first heard him play, I thought, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, but it took me about 45 years to really understand the depth and the complexity of Kid Ori's uh, sense of rhythm. Brad, yes. what do you do when you're not playing music? Um, you know, I'm listening to music. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you can practice a lot with all your instruments. I, I listen to music, I practice things in my head. Uh, I'm always, especially recently, I've been just thinking a lot about uh, different songs. Uh, what songs I would like to add to my repertoire, or what harmonies I want to use. So yeah, I just I do listen to and think about music a lot. I don't really watch TV too much. Um, yeah, I listen, when I'm not playing music, I am listening to it and thinking about it a lot. And thinking of new tunes to write. Okay. <laughs> so so what, what have you done for a living? Um, I was making a living as, with, as a trombone player up until about 9-11, uh, but to support my trombone habit, I've done lots of other things related to music. Um, I was a tour manager for some jazz groups of Warner Brothers Records when I was living in New York um, and touring and doing the business and managing side of it, uh, which was good to do and good to learn about. Um, I also I'm kind of good at typing and with computers and stuff like that. So uh, I also worked at Sony Music International's offices uh, with the CD import division, just developing uh, and writing a program so that they can keep track of CDs from all of their affiliates in the world coming into the U.S. And I did that for a couple of years. Um, I've done temp work. Uh, I don't know. I guess I can do pretty much almost anything. I always wanted to be a waiter. I, I waited tables in New York. I wanted to be a New York waiter. I, my friend was a maitre d' at a nice East Village restaurant. I waited tables for six months. That was actually really fun. And uh, it wasn't like work at all. It was quite, quite fun. So, yeah, I've done everything. I think a lot of musicians have done 
lots of other things other than play their instrument, but uh, yeah. I've done a lot of different things. What happened then that sort of that well, changed your ability to? Um, I've always been a member of a big band since I was in high school. Uh, Ron Paley hired me when I was 16 years old to, and to be in his big band. And I never had to go look for work anywhere else. I was always part of a band. When I moved to Montreal, I was part of other people's bands. Uh, when I moved to New York, I was part of somebody's big band all the time. And we'd be touring all the time. And the Europeans and the Japanese, and they would bring big bands over there for a month or two months at a time every year. I'd spend about four months a year overseas, either in Europe or Asia. But when 9-11 happened, everybody kind of panicked and, you know, cut back on the uh, uh, spending. And the first thing that they always gets cut is entertainment. So to fly 16 people overseas is quite expensive. Uh, so they stopped really flying big bands uh, around so much, even domestically, like every weekend I'd be playing somewhere in the U.S. at some concert hall. Uh, all that stopped up 9-11, and it, people just hire duos, trios, and stuff like that now because it's cheaper, and try to reuse people, you know, uh, use the same bass player for different groups and stuff. And all I've ever done was big band work, so uh, when that happened, uh, my work Oh, it changed actually. I worked with sal in salsa bands. I worked at the Copacabana in New York, at, at part of the house band there. So, any salsa band that came in from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, whatever, we were like the horn section. So that was kind of fun. That was a smaller thing. Um, I did a lot of Dixieland music. I did a lot of uh, uh, dances with Vince Giordano's Nighthawk, which is an 11-piece band that does weddings and movie soundtracks and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it was nice to have a regular paycheck from, like, a Duke Ellington Orchestra um, to rely on. And with the other bands, it was, like, not quite as regular or reliable. So, yes. Things have changed. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. So you started in Winnipeg. Yes. And then you left in, your, in the States, New York, for a while. What yes. brought you back to Canada and Edmonton in particular? Well, um, you know, my rent was $1,100 a month for about five years. And I had a huge one-bedroom apartment to myself in Washington Heights. And in 2008, they were going to raise my rent to like 1600 a month. Which isn't that much. They could they could raise it to like double, but um, you know I was doing like every kind of get for forty dollar gig and to try to make my rent, and I was just running myself ragged just to to break even, and um, I wasn't really enjoying the kind of work that I was doing. So I decided to just uh, pack everything up and come back to Canada. Uh, plus the immigration thing was really difficult with after nine eleven too. You know. Oh, yeah. uh, work visas and all that stuff and it was just too much work for not enough payback and okay. um, so while I was living in New York my family relocated from Winnipeg to Edmonton and so I went to work directly on cruise ships when I left New York and during my break from the cruise ships I would come stay with my family here in Edmonton and that's how I kind of ended up here in Edmonton. Okay. Yes, I did cruises for about three years, and then when that stopped, I'm kind of stranded in Edmonton. So. But it's it's a nice strand, and I've always uh, admired the musicians from Edmonton a lot, so it's uh, nice to meet all the people that I listen to on records. We have we have a really good musical culture yes. here. It's, yes. it's We're very lucky. Very yep. lucky. I'm not sure how many people know this, but you were involved with the Aviator movie soundtrack. Um, and how did you end up being a part of that collaboration? Um, well, I was a member of Vince Giordano's Nighthawks when I, since 1991 when I first moved to New York. And he is very well known for playing 1910s, 20s, 30s music. And he's got a really good reputation. He's been doing it since he was like 15. So people in Hollywood, when they need 
someone to play 1920s, 30s jazz. They called me Spiridano, and I was his trombone player. He only had one trombone player, so uh, I kind of, by default, was the trombone player on all those uh, soundtracks that Vince Spiridano did. What's What's that experience like playing for for a soundtrack? Um, you know, I kind of like it. It's uh, you never know what's going to be what you're going to be playing. The only thing I don't like is that they usually start recording at nine or ten in the morning. Although, actually, the aviator those those were like at eight p.m. So that was better. Okay. But I never knew what we were going to be recording. Uh, you just show up in the studio and music is on the stand. And you have like an hour and a half to make four, five, six charts sound perfect. And you get one run through and then one recording. I like that challenge. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was it was fun. It was, I, I like doing that kind of stuff. It keeps my mind active for sight reading and you know, on, on the spot to uh, make something sound really good that you've never seen before. Yeah. So, that actually, that's, it sounds intense. You know, it sounds intense, but it's, when you're doing it a lot, which I was, it's, it's kind of fun, you know, it's like a, it's like a challenge. Yeah. Um, sight reading, I became very good at sight reading from playing with Dinstry Downs band because he has about, I don't know, over 10,000 charts in his band book, and he'll always call something on some gig that I've never played before. And a lot of times the tempos are blistering and fast, um, and especially when we play for dancers and stuff like that. You know, play like really fast uh, tempos, so you're just trying to hang on, and you know, it, it makes you stronger. Okay. So, yes. Have you ever danced? Have I ever danced? Um, you know, I really would like to learn how to tap dance, but uh, you know, I do. I do like to dance, yeah. Um, actually, when I, I used to like to go to uh, Amish Man at the Apollo on Wednesday nights. Uh, tickets are only like $12 to sit in the main floor. And I got called up to do the Soul Train Dance Competition. You know, they pick like 10 people from the audience, and then the live band plays, and you each have to dance for 20 seconds, and then the audience uh, votes on who, who was the best, and you win like a record or something. I didn't win, but um, I do like dancing to all kinds of music. I'm not very good, though. I don't think I would do it in public. I would like to learn how to tap dance. Okay. Yeah. So, um, we've been wondering, sexual chocolate. Yes. Where did that come from? That is a reference to a movie that is revered and referenced by almost every mus musician that I've worked with in New York, every black musician. It's uh, Eddie Murphy's greatest movie, I think, ever, uh, coming to America with mm -hmm. him and Arsenio Hall and James Earl Jones. And uh, Eddie Murphy plays lots of different characters. And one of the characters he plays in that movie is uh, a really overweight priest, a Baptist priest. And I don't know, actually, he's, he's, he's like a religious soul singer, but he's like over the hill, you know, with a big pot belly and um, dripping jerry curls. And he performs at the, uh, in the community center of the church with his band, and his band is sexual chocolate, and he's horrible. And he's, he sings uh, Whitney Houston's uh, Let them lead the way. What's that called? The greatest love of all. His greatest love of all. Yeah. And it's horrible. It's just like sax tenor saxophone, drums, keyboard, and him with his big belly singing. And he sings, and then after he's done, it's so horrible. Nobody claps. And he's going, How about a hand for five hands? Six with chocolate. And nobody claps. And he has to stop his feet. Six with chocolate. And it's, it's quite fun. Uh, I recommend everybody who loves music. And who loves comedy, check out because it's got so many funny moments in it. But yeah, sexual chocolate is, That's a reference to. is quite funny because uh, when people don't clap, then you know, it's the way to make them clap, you stomp your feet. <laughs>
Yeah. Once you see the movie, you'll never, you'll never uh, be the same. <laughs> it's quite good. So, is there any way for your fans to get a hold of you? Um, they can email me, Brad should get it at AOL.com. I know AOL, it's almost as bad as CompuServe.com, but uh, I'm moving over to Google. I do actually have Brad should get it at Google.com. Uh, as well, I need to get a web page uh, eventually, but uh, I don't have one right now. There's a web designer right here. Uh, I've been meaning to do that, um, and I will. I'm going to record my first album in the next few years, too. So when I get my album together, then I'll have a web page. You know, so people can buy it. Well, I can tell you, I'm excited to hear that you're going to be coming out with an album, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of other dancers who would be looking forward to picking up. Yes, it's going to be, you know, I'm not going to do a bunch of original modern jazz songs that you're not going to remember or want to play again after you listen to it. It's going to be all standards that have meaning for me at different points in my career. And, uh, yeah, I think I might need to sing a few numbers on there, too. Well, it's, it's going to have to have I Can Have Dad on it, right? You know, I wasn't planning on that. No, I was... I, I don't know which one I'm going to sing. I, I, it's going to be a, a string quartet and rhythm section. So it's, it's going to be very, something very old school. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But uh, definitely we'll be dancing as well. So. Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to say to everyone watching? Well, I'm really glad that Swing Out Abbey can exist because, uh, you know, having these gigs, I'm kind of a lazy person. A lot of musicians are kind of lazy. If you don't have a, a goal, something to work for, um, you just don't do it. So having uh, Swing Out Abbey dances and different themes of the dances that I'm trying to work out with Berkeley makes me actually plan and write out music uh, that I never would have done. And then once I have it, it's, it's there. So... Um, I, it's good to keep me working and inspired, and I'm really excited about. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do a Mardi Gras thing or a New Orleans theme one because I do want to do some Kid Ori stuff, like maybe 10 or 15 original Kid Ori, real authentic uh, New Orleans band stuff, and you guys are really gonna like it because that's very danceable. Yeah. Yes. That sounds awesome. Thanks for visiting with us and Brad Shigeta of Sexual Chocolate. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. This has been Renita Long for Swing Out Edmonton. <laughs> Thank you, you and good night. You got so cool. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. <laughs>